Well, this segment takes us to uh, the city of Barstow, and uh, this is a new one. This is one that a lot of us in Big Bird don't know about. It's the Mojave River Valley Museum. And we're here as part of the Bear Valley Historical Society tour. So let's go in and uh, see what it's all about. You know, I had to work with Dee Simpson and, Lee and Dr. Louis Buniki and Alan Bassett and Ritter Sales and Mr. and Mrs. Tubbs and all the people who have worked at Ray Matt's site. And then I went attended the University of Exeter in Devon County in England at age 16 and with a letter from Leakey for the instructors to give me instruction in related paleontology. And as a result, I've been studying paleontology since before I was in high school. And I've attended Arizona State University, UCR, summer sessions and stuff. I never really got any kind of degree except uh, became an optician for 27 years. Because a counselor told me I'd make more money in the service industry. And now I'm retired from that and I work for a environmental consulting firm called LSA, which goes around and looks for fossils at construction sites. And what you see in front of you here is a half a million year old Colombian mammoth. And this thing was found on February the 2nd over between Highway 395 and I-15 off of Mojave Drive. And we have been, we only found uh, of the animal actually the pelvis, a scapula, a tooth, and a partial tusk, and a, and a tusk. And oh yeah, an ankle bone called a lunar from the upper part of the ankle. And Why those, is it called uh, Columbia? Um, well, I should have just said mammoth. Because until we get the whole thing and put it together, Columbia mammoths are the biggest one of them all. So when you come to getting a very curved, seven foot long tusk, odds are it's Columbia mammoths. <laughs> you know? And we have a little rundown of different types of proboscideans that lived in the Western Hemisphere over the last few million years. And you've got, in the way of animals, things called Gothotheria, Myotherium, Stegodibelodon, which instead of having tusks, you have a, a shovel type of under tusk thing, and he lived like kind of like a giant pig. And then, of course, you've got your mammoth and mastodon. And the difference between mammoth and mastodon, besides the skull structure, is the dental structure. And this here is a mammoth tooth. And it's enamel, like the enamel on our teeth, lines up in little columns. So, all too often on these sites, I see the remnants of the aftermath of being hit by a bulldozer. So I have to learn to see what's the pieces and go, oh, I've got a lost piece of an elephant. Like this one here was hooked out by a big tiller thing, and Mary Shear, my colleague, found it. I thought I was going to have a day off out of Rainbow Basin, and I get a call on the cell phone from my boss. Mary says she's got a tooth, she's got a tooth. i got to drive all the way to to get this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very diagnostic in telling us what we are. This, the teeth having their enamel in little columns is indicative of your mammoths. Your mastodont, on the other hand, over in this case is a plaster copy, and you can look at it, there's, there's the real thing, and then a plaster copy of a, ma of a mammoth, I mean, of a, a mastodont tooth. The mastodont tooth tend to have more of a peg-shaped tooth or a mortar or pedestal type tooth with the enamel growing all on the outside like ours. So you've got, this guy here has got a cheese grinder tooth, and he eats more leaves. And that guy has a mortar pedestal tooth, and he must have eaten more sticks and stuff. And that's one of the ways that you can tell. And also the other ways that we can tell is by the size and shape of the uh, pelvis. And the little triangular bone in that glass case there, called a lunar, is very specific to mammoth and mastodon. They always have a different shape than each one. So we can, then figure out we got partially uh, this fruit of a mammoth as opposed to having gotten a mastodont. Um, you guys are going to go out to Rainbow Basin today? Correct. Uh, depending on what kind of shoes we got. Do you guys up to a uh, about a quarter mile hike round trip to a slop canyon and a cave in Owl Canyon? I'd be willing to take you. Sure. It's really a cute adventure. I can take you by a panel of 16 million year old camel tracks. And then the, uh, it's a real uh, Huck Finn kind of thing, this little cave. When you go into the cave, it, uh, I'll stop and tell you now, that, you know, be very careful going into any of the caves out here 
abandoned mines and whatnot. We had a guy a week ago get killed over in the Calicos. And then just last Friday, an exact week later after the guy got killed, another guy went to the very same tunnel and fell down the same shaft. <laughs> Fortunately, he didn't get killed. But all these mines are in these tunnels out here are very, very safe, unsafe. And so just be very careful. But where I will take you today, if you guys want to go, is a naturally fault-generated cave. And it's in a very soft uh, lake bottom sediments from the Miocene times. And the fault has caused a crack through it, and the water seeped through it, creating this deep little cave. When you get partway, you don't even need a flashlight, because if you can get partway through, the other end is open, and your eyes start adjusting the darkness just in time to see the light from the other end. And then we get the other end, it gets out of the wind, turn around, go out, and then get lectured to about how you're officially now the members of the secret society of troglodytes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rainbow Basin. Uh, there, the Rimman site was we never found any bones. The bones don't fossilize on a hill. The only place you're going to find your evidence of early man will be on the edge of ancient Lake Mannix. Uh, you heard about Lake Mannix and its relationship to early man site? Lake Mannix was a giant inland freshwater body that's laid out here between the Newberry Mountains and Afton Canyon, and it went up into the Crowanese. The Mojave River is an upside down backward river. And it flows inland and away from the sea and ends up in the Mojave Sink. And back in the Pleistocene times, about 18,000 years ago, there was this giant lake called Lake Mannix that was sitting right at the foot of where the early man site is. When you go down hill and a little north and east of early man site, you run into the shorelines of ancient Lake Mannix. And about 18,000 years ago, a fault broke a natural dam at, Afton, at what is now Afton Canyon and catastrophically draining Lake Mannix in the blink of an eye geologically, leaving behind a mini Grand Canyon called Afton Canyon. And that, of course, is another interesting place to go for a field trip sometime if you guys ever want to. Because it's historically, besides that bit of history I gave you, it's the first place that Father Garces hit California in 1776 when he was trying to prove that California wasn't an island. And it's also where all the major railroads and the camel people came through surveying the 35th parallel. Afton is really quite interesting. But anyway, that's the story of Lake Mannix and its relationship to the early man site. Now, if they're going, Leakey told me as a kid around the campfire that elsewhere will prove early man site's validity. And what he was meaning is elsewhere around the edge of Lake Mannix. But what has happened all in all, elsewhere further afield, down in Chile, in a place called Monteverde, there is finding woven things and other human tools that are dating back more than 25,000 years. In upstate New York, they're finding tools that are going back 16,000 years and whatever. So, early man site, even though I never want to dig there again, uh, I would rather go dig down in our early Mannix. Early man site itself is only in, of interest in the sense that it is very, very historic. It's the oldest continuing operating archaeological site in the Western Hemisphere. So, you know, I'm not wanting to take away from it. I just want to let you guys have a realistic uh, view of it, that they're wanting to say that the evidence of man is far older and will be accepted by the intelligentsia. Uh, early man site. And over here at this wall is a case devoted to leaky early man site and, and the, the pits. And the next case over from it has a chronology of from historic Indians, Native Americans, to Paleo Indians and the different point Um, over here in the back wall, the case back there, the case on this side of the case is all of the Miocene fossils that come from the Larson Formation. The Larson Formation is 12 million year old type formation of uh, Miocene and Miocene fossils. And we have two volcanic ash layers, the other rainbow basin we'll discuss as an ash layer. And these ash layers are precisely eight. And one of them is 
dissolve almost anything in it, and then when you percolate it through a formation, it replaces the petrified wood or bone or dino bone, and it will replace the um, organics almost to the cellular level. And that bone is now completely agonized, and it's just agony. And it's absolutely amazing. So if you guys want to look around while I fumble with this and see if I can find the varsity formation uh, thing I want to show you. This is really quite a museum here. It's much larger than I thought. There's a lot of early, early Indian relics and artifacts. It's a dry washer. A lot of mining, of course, in the desert area. By the Garlock Fault in the north, come back here, and the San Andreas Fault. Because of the action of the Garlock Fault and San Andreas Fault for millions of years, this whole area has been like a big plate or series of broken plates, and it has rotated. And that area of the Mud Hills, Rainbow Basin, is in the very vortex, like it's like in, in a, a whirlpool of rock, and that's why you get all that beautiful faulting and folding. Okay, now you move along. And this again is a satellite picture of the same map. And this is the San Andreas oh, wow. Fault here. And there's your mountains, San Diego Mountains. This is the Mojave River going inland and in, in, in inside, away from the sea. And this is the Barstow <laughs> Syncline. And in the center of the Rainbow Basin, that's what they call this rainbow. And this has been uplifted by a fault and then slumped, extended, and then it slumped down, creating the synclinal structure. <clears throat> Up here, you get your normal beds that you get with geology that are laid down in an orderly fashion, the oldest on the bottom and the youngest on the top. What you run into is a um, these angular beds will hit that orderly bed and that's called an angular unconformity. And it's breaking the rules of geology. Yeah. Some more fossils here. Look at that one. I see the teeth. It's still intact underneath, even when we're driving on this place is so hard. So we come back in, and you see my colleague Ray mm -hmm. David Merrill there. Mm -hmm. she and here's a mammoth tusk and then from the Victorville. After the toilet fish issue, we put aluminum foil, and after the aluminum foil, mm -hmm. we put the gauze bandage like you use for a an arm. This is a mammoth sinus. Sinus, isn't that something? Around the outside, it's called flat and jacket. And then we bring it into a place where we can see all these metal kits. Mastodon teeth. Well, they're big. Bone crushing dog jawbone. Yeah, well, if you'll notice the difference between tusk and bone. Bone has a spongy interior called sponge bone. A lot of marine fossils found out here, of course, is just uh, beyond the water. When you think of the camels, you think of them with a big hump on them. Yeah. This is Miocene camel. 5.3 million years ago, and there's a skeleton, and that's how they know, but you can see what a camel looked like at that time. Nowhere resembles the camel of today. Boy, look at this old organ. It's called the Calico Organ. Ghost Town Saloon survived the fire of the 1880s. But boy, this is an old one. Look at you pump the bellows. Wow. I feel like any museum, they have a wonderful book section. Pioneer of the Mojave, Mojave Rendezvous. A lot of, a lot of good books here. As you can see. This is quite a museum. If you're ever in Barstow, it's uh, on the 247 as you come into Barstow from Big Bear on Barstow Road. Just cross the freeway and then it's the first street on the left. You can see it by the large old uh, train car out in front. Hi there, how are you? Uh, the, the museum is open Seven days, or, or is yes. it closed? It's seven days. Uh huh. And what are the hours? From eleven o'clock to four o'clock. Eleven o'clock to four o'clock. 
and it's free, but you accept donations. Always. Always. always never money. have enough money. <laughs> this is wonderful. A lot of people don't really realize the history of the Mojave. Oh, I think that's true. And, and, uh, uh, well, sometimes I think that's not history. That was there when I was a kid, but I guess yeah. I'm getting to be history. <laughs> Do you know about how many people a year come through here? No, I don't. don't yeah. I, I usually do Mondays and Mondays very quiet. Of sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, we're here with the Big Bear Lake, or Big Bear Valley Historical Society, and uh, this is really something, there's folks. Yes, there's restrooms. So they have full restrooms. That's mostly people's. Huh? Oh, I was talking to him. Oh. That's, but that's just odds and ends. Of odds and ends here. You don't have any. Wow, very good. Oh, they got a free calendar. A guide to the Wild Mojave. Well, this is pretty good. This is really a, a lot larger than it looks from the exterior, and it's just filled wall to wall. So next time we're going to Barstow, stop by here and go through here. It's free and a lot of things that are interesting. You're interested in history. Well, the tour and the presentation right here at the Mojave River Valley Museum is all over. The Historical Society is now going to move on to a tour of Rainbow Canyon and then end up at Calico Ghost Town. We'll just stick along with them. So that ends this segment. Stay tuned now. Or I'll be right back after these words from our sponsors.